That's great. Um, yeah, so today we're going to talk about modeling the accretion flow around Sagittarius A star and calculating observables from our models. So a lot of you might have heard of Sagittarius A star recently. Last year, the EHT, which is the Event Horizon Telescope, they published their results from observations where they directly imaged and were able to resolve a shadow in the emission region of Sagittarius A star. That picture is up there in the upper right-hand corner. And down in the left-hand side is ALMA, which is one of the telescopes that's a part of the EHT and occasionally makes other independent observations of Sagittarius A star. And so here it's you know, looking and trying to discover new things, but I do theory work. And so we were trying to model um, this object. So despite these recent you know, new news stories about Sagittarius A star, we've known about it for decades. We've observed it across the electromagnetic spectrum and that's given theorists and astrophysicists quite a lot to think about. We made a lot of progress in understanding what is Sagittarius A star and some details of the emission but there's still a lot of unknowns. Um, there's a lot of key parameters of the object we don't know. For example, we don't know its angular momentum. We don't know if you know this object is like a disc-like shape or a torus. We don't know how it's inclined to the observer. And we also don't know if the angular momentum of the emission region, like a disc or a torus, is precisely aligned with the angular momentum of the inner object. And this causes some issues if we want to model Sagittarius A star, a lot of these parameters can lead to quite different kinds of physics and different kinds of observables. But that's, you know, it's, that's all good um, because we can still do quite a lot of uh, modeling. So I'm gonna be focusing on global models of the accretion flow in Sagittarius A star. And what I'm gonna show is that there's a relationship between the 230 gigahertz size of the emission and the uh, near infrared light curve. And this is important because this relationship seems to persist across all these unknown parameters of Sagittarius A star. And with that, I guess we'll go get started. And if you know, there's any questions uh, throughout this talk, just let me know and you can interrupt. All right, so first things first, Oh, here's just like a brief outline. So I'm going to discuss some observations. What? Oh. Yeah. Okay. So That's a nice quick outline. This is like my most boring slide. A lot of them have colors. Uh, just reviewing some key observations. It's going to help us motivate our models and also understand what's happening. Um, then just what's like the anatomy of black hole? What are some key regions that are relevant to our models? We're gonna talk about GRMHD or general elastic magnetohydrodynamics. That's the model we're gonna use to describe the accretion flow around Sagittarius A star. And then discussing how do we make images from this model? And finally, ending with our results. All right, so what is Sagittarius A star? It is very, very, um, there's a lot of strong evidence that it is a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. So this video is um, showing stars at the center of our galaxy. And that big star in the middle is, you'll see a very center of a lot of these stellar orbits. So I'll just play the movie, but I'm sure you've seen this before. And by tracking the eccentricity and the orbits of these stars, we can find that that central object has an incredible mass of uh, 4 million suns. So it's you know quite large, but it's also quite faint. So we're like, what could this be? Um, you might be interested of like, how compact is this object? And so we can use a distance that General Teddy gives us. Uh, we can measure distances and units of GM over C squared, where M is the mass of some central compact object, and C squared is the speed of light, uh, G is the gravitational constant. And so we'll introduce this unit of distance and try to understand how close these stars are to this central object. And they're close, but maybe you know not super close. So about uh, you know 3,000 uh, RG away from this central object. So you can say, maybe I'm not convinced. I don't think this is a black hole. Well, there's more evidence. Um, 
you know, and kind of the most, there's a lot more evidence, but the, you know, most clear evidence to me is just this image from the EHD that was released last year. And to understand this image, we have to think about general relativity a little bit. So a lot of you are familiar with the event horizon of a non-rotating black hole. That's that quantity two gm over c squared, where anything that happens uh, beyond the horizon or kind of closer into the black hole center isn't connected to the outside uh, accretion disk or you know whatever is going on in the outside space time. But there's another key parameter, which is this minimum impact parameter for a null geodesic. So if you have a photon coming from infinity or you know somewhere out there far in the disk, there's a minimum parameter it needs to meet. If it is less than this parameter, what's going to happen is as it kind of moves around the black hole, it won't escape out to infinity. So the photons that we see aren't directly from the event horizon, or like the shadow isn't directly caused by the event horizon. It's actually caused by how the photon geodesics um, are around the object. And it's a radius that's a little larger than the event horizon. So we can find a effective area, which we call the black hole shadow. And if we, and the key part of the shadow is that it's mostly a, a function of mass. There's a small correction and deformation if you have spin involved, uh, like if your black hole has some angular momentum, but the key idea is still the same, that mass dependence still remains. And so we can extract the mass of our central object by measuring the size of the shadow. And we find a result that's remarkably consistent with our asteroid Namics observations. When you say the photons don't escape to infinity, yeah, do you mean they end up in the black hole, or yeah, they can so do they a few things. Get turned around and um, they can. Yeah. So yeah, so what I mean is like either they can fall in, or they can. Sometimes there's like some weird orbits where they can just like kind of go around in like circles and circles and circles around the black hole. Is it? Are they all reversible? Time reversible trajectories. You, like you're saying, if it goes one way, it can go the other. Yeah, I think so. Unless it falls in. And, you know, right, yeah, so it fall, um, falls in. Yeah. But, I mean, as far as, like, orbiting. Uh -huh. Yeah, so I guess, I mean, if I understand correctly, if, if, if the impact parameter is large enough, it will be just bent like this. Yeah. But if it gets smaller and smaller, there is a, it will do full circle around the black hole and then escape. And then if it gets closer in, it will do several circles and then escape. But then there is a critical one, right? When you will correspond to an infinite number of circles. So mm -hmm. below that, it, right? <laughs> then it can fall in. Yeah, and I mean, the, like that, it will fall in. They get like quite complicated, like in yeah. the vicinity of the black hole. Um, yeah, but the key thing is when you look at this image, you don't look directly at the event horizon. Um, you're looking at this, you know, where photons aren't able to escape, kind of this gap. So if any photons were produced at the location of those orbits, they might escape in all Yeah, those they believe can escape. Yeah, that's right. So that's, that's a, um, yeah, that's possible. But yeah, then it, because you can also see, like, I've seen, like, research done where they map all the photon orbits really close to the horizon, and it's like this crazy spaghetti. Um, so there's quite a variety. Since we can see, I guess we're not mm -hmm. looking at the event horizon directly, but since we see like the shadow, does that mean that it's inclined relative to the Milky Way? So, oh, so I don't know about the Milky Way. So, but the, yeah, so as far as the shadow, no. So because the black hole really warps the space time around it, um, it's able to create photon trajectories that aren't like our traditional version of Euclidean space. So if you know, imagine like you had a disk and like you're saying, you're like, what if the disk is like this, right? I, I can't see a shadow. But in GR, um, you can see some sort of shadow even at pretty high inclinations. So you don't expect the shadow to completely go away. It can change its shape, especially if the black hole is spin because that means that there's like a symmetry broken there with the spin. And so if I incline at different angles and I might get slightly different shadows, but those effects are fairly small corrections to this main relationship between um, the shadow size and the black hole mass. All right. Okay, so Sagittarius A star, or sometimes we call it just Sag A star uh, for short, because I guess Sagittarius is too long of a word, um, but it's not completely dark, right? We saw some emission around this object. And in fact, we can measure 
it in the infrared and the millimeter. And what we find in the infrared is that there are these fairly significant flux peaks. So the median value um, is 1.1 millijanskis, which are like the units on this plot. Uh, these results come from the gravity collaboration, and I'll discuss gravity in a moment, but they're able to take these light curves. And what you can see are these incredibly sharp peaks. So each observation is maybe several hours long. Um, you see these peaks, which are kind of the biggest one is about 25 times uh, the median value. And so you can ask, well, is there some sort of variability, intrinsic variability of the source that's causing these peaks where it gets brighter over a wide range of wavelengths? And the answer is no. So if we look and uh, what is the resolution or the temporal how, resolution how big of an area? area are you looking at? So it's, I assume it's much, much, much bigger, 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 bigger than um, so gravity. So this light comes from what region? It. I mean, it. I think they're treating it as a point source rather than just as. I mean, I, I'm going to discuss. So gravity is also able to make um, like uh, it can do inferometry. And then there you get some uh, spatial resolution, but I'm not sure if they like integrated that somehow to produce like a total flux curve or if they're just able to look at it as a point source. I guess what I'm is, uh, do we know that all of this is coming from some region around do. the black hole or does it include a lot of accretion disk? I have a slide on that. Ah, okay. Oh, <laughs> two, two slides away. So. Um, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a really good question. And yeah, it's not immediately clear. Uh, so like here, we're just thinking of it as like some sort of point source on the sky. It's getting brighter and dimmer um, with these, you know, these sort of increases in flux. And yeah, and then I'll discuss like where we think this emission is actually coming from. Okay, so in when we look in the millimeter or the submillimeter, we don't see that variation. So this is another, this is not the same uh, in the red flux peak, but it's just, at a different time with a different instrument. And you can see here that you get maybe like a eight time increase in the uh, total flux. But in the millimeter, which is the bottom slide, you really don't get that much variation. And in fact, if you pay attention to the um, axes, you'll see that it's not even double um, in, 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 uh, in total flux. All right. So, that begs the question, what could be causing this difference where you don't see a some millimeter counterpart, but you see an infrared counterpart? And one explanation is that maybe there's some sort of mechanism that accelerates electrons somewhere. But what this mechanism is, how it does it, we, we have no idea, right? Well, we don't quite know yet. Um, we have to have more information. So this is the gravity instrument. It's uh, four telescopes, their beams are combined, so it acts like an inferometer in the near infrared and a uh, few wave bands around them. And so what they're able to do with this Sorry, instrument, where is it? it's in Chile. In Chile. Yeah. Yeah, this is in Chile. It's in one of those desert is it, locations. Is it on Atacama? Yeah, in the Atacama. I don't know, like, is this the which one? Or is the cloud? I mean, what do we see? I'm just curious. <laughs> it looks like, it looks it's, like it's not far from the shore. I think it is the sea. But I know that Atacama Desert is five kilometers high. Yeah, so. but I, I don't think it's, I don't it's actually know. Yeah. Maybe it's right. Maybe it's cloud. Cloud. Maybe it is cloud. I mean, all of Chile is close to the shore. <laughs> yeah, <that's true>. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know exactly where the location is. I just, I think it's kind of cool because you can, you know, they show like the telescopes and then they show like the little beam combinings. And then this is the actual instrument that like combines the beams and is able to, um, you know, like actually observe things. Well, I agree that that's a cool image, but yeah, I don't know how that is. Because that's a, you know, sunset. Right? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. It looks like the sea from here, but it could be clouds because it's like 14,000 feet up or something crazy. Um, and this is collecting micron wavelengths that's near infrared. Yeah, so like uh, the K band is what I'm mostly referring to is 2.2 microns. Um, we're not really microns, but micrometers. And so these are yes. like optical telescopes. Yeah, yeah, near infrared. infrared. And uh, how big? But not the submillimeter and the millimeter ones. Yeah, but how big are they? Yeah. But this is a big. I mean, like, I mean look at these. <laughs> 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 so, like these are like a, I think these are very big. Yeah. 
Are there something like probably human size? One or two. No, they're pretty big. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't, I don't remember the size. Also, um, okay, okay. I also think it's a relatively new instrument. I think it's our first site, like around 2017, maybe. Um, but don't quote me on that. I'm not 100 percent sure. Okay, so this is a very cool thing, um, but it's cooler what we can do with this thing. Uh, and what it can do is it can actually track uh, the centroid motion in the near infrared. So it's a centroid that's developed from you know interfering using inferometry, but you can think of it in your head as the first moment of some intensity map. And when we do that, we can see that here in the black line is some near infrared flux. There's a peak around this time. And what's happening is these blue and these red lines are the offset from the mean centroid position. So just to uh -huh. clarify, so now we're talking about uh, X and Y, right? Centroid yeah. in, the, in the plane of the sky. Right, so this so field of view is like, um, I want to try to, like the max size is about like 150 micro arc seconds. I think it's like looking maybe about like, you know, 300 micro arc seconds, something like that. Um, so yeah, so that centroid moves about like 150 micro arc seconds on the sky. So Wait, one question, like, how is it actually doing interferometry in the near infrared? Is it record, are the detectors actually recording phase information and is it adding stuff in the background or is it actually mixing light? I mean, as far as I'm aware, it's mixing those four beams uh, to do the infrared. I don't, I mean, I know that the background is important when it comes to making sure like the stars in the vicinity don't um, affect the measurements, but I'm not sure. Like, I think it uses like, um, like S2 as like a reference, if that answers your question to do this. I mean, I'm just, I'm just trying to borrow from radio where yeah. actually have phase detection. I like, I know that there's like a video, like I looked at this video online that shows this like really complex way that the beam is combined. Like it's, you know, clearly not just one mirror, one beam splitter, but it's like this sort of web of beams and then it finally combines and they're able to do measurements. It seems like you would have to combine okay, the okay. itself. Yes. Or yes. they would build them farther apart. And yes. Yeah, I mean, this is like direct. So it's not like doing what the EHC does where they time their measurements well and then later right. uh, calculate it. I mean, this is like a physical, like the actual light beams are physically combined on site and they produce a measurement. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was asking. And basically, whether they oh, have detection for that, but they probably don't. Okay, thanks. Okay, so the way the geometry is done yeah. in radio way in millimeter, and here is very different, basically. Yeah. Here is the actual classical interferometry. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, so then we can see that these are offsets from the uh, median centroid position. And so you kind of start here with not that much change, but all of a sudden you get um, this big like sinusoidal sort of shape. And you're like, well, what is this shape? I have, I can't really imagine it while well, I have a picture to show you. And so this is the same data, but it's plotted on the XY plane. Uh, these arrows represent time. So this occurs over the course of about 30 minutes. And you can see that it moves counterclockwise on the sky. This pink cross is the median center. Um, so that's like the median value of the centroid. And then this is, you can think of it as like the black hole position, but it's technically the very center of one of the stellar orbits. And with like, you know, corresponding uncertainties. So our result is that we can measure that during a near infrared flare event, the centroid, the near infrared centroid makes a rotation around the black hole. And so and this is, you know, answering Greg's question, where does this emission come from? Um, so, you, is there a way to remove this? Oh, yeah. Right. I, didn't, I didn't realize you can see me moving around. OK. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. And then see from the, the, the little up there. Yeah. Up there on the um, yeah. OK, yeah. that's good. Thanks. There's a way to get rid of that. But oh, no, it just goes by itself. OK, great. So then we can ask, okay, where does all this emission come from? Well, we know a few things about this emission that helps us. Uh, we measure high, like relatively high polarization fractions. So we know that this emission is synchrotron dominated. That means that there's synchrotron emission and magnetic fields are at play. We also 
are able to fit the spectrum of Sagittarius A star with thermal electron synchrotron models or thermally distributed electron synchrotron models. And we find that these models fit uh, the spectrum well, especially around you know, the 230 gigahertz range. You can kind of see a little bit of an offset of lower frequencies. Um, these higher frequencies are kind of upper bounds on the flaring behavior. So they're not, you know, mostly thermal electrons. Um, and the parameter, like the differences in lines are like, there's like tweaking a small parameter. Yeah, please guide us here. What is uh, gravity and where is EHT? Yeah, so EHT is right here um, at this so line. Is, yeah, so it's really bigger. Yeah, so this is like 1.3 millimeters. Um, so that's right here. And this is where, you know, we have mostly thermal uh, so electrons hit the spectrum fairly well. And then uh, gravity would be like, well, roughly, right? Yeah, yeah. Right, so. somewhere there. Um, so, and so this is the near infrared flaring. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and if we, uh, you know, if we assume thermal electrons in our models, or to understand what's happening in the emission, you know, we can say that the near infrared flux comes from really close to the black hole, around five to ten RG. That's really close to the event horizon, and um, also the two thirty gigahertz flux comes from. Uh, radius slightly larger than the near infrared. So I'm sorry, it's so the, close. The red statement, the NIR flux beam, uh -huh. that's, that's from the centroid plots that you showed. Is that so? So I space that. This is just, yeah, so this is like saying, like, let's say we, like, so we fit this to a thermal, uh, thermally distributed electron synchrotron model. And then we say, okay, well, what does that mean about uh, like different frequencies? Like, where like kind of their um, like what's the um, uh, my god well, but that's like, like the, the tau like what's you know what's but like, they show us the orbit right the rotation yeah. that's right roughly the size of the I mean yeah I mean that's my next point actually so the next point but I, I'm confused how how are you so how do you correlate the the emission location like that it's ten just by saying it's like kind of like, like kind of like a black body like it's thermally um, distributed so. That like emission at certain frequencies comes from like different like effective um, optical gap. Mm, sorry, but don't you have images? Well, and we also have images, but um, yeah, this is like just motivating that when we want to model the near infrared in 230 gigahertz, we have to include GR effects because we're going very close to the event horizon. So does this depend on the photon trajectories? No, or, this is the like where does the so are you saying that for the NIRF flux, uh -huh. if it were emitted at smaller radii, it would be absorbed before it reaches to us, reaches us? No, it's not a, absorbed. It's just so that it comes from that optical like, depth. Well, that it comes from like a kind of a region that's closer to the black hole. That, yeah, I'll ask later. Okay. okay. Like if you imagine like a black body and you look at different frequencies in the black body and you're looking at kind of different um, like effective like photospheres at each frequency, that kind of effect. Uh, yeah, go, go ahead. Well, okay. You might answer my question. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Okay. So, no. But what's, okay. I think, so, important sorry. for understanding. So in addition to, do I understand correctly, that's uh -huh. in addition to imaging, right? What we yeah. have here is you just have the amount of flux at a given frequency. Mm -hmm. And if it's thermal emission, then, uh, you know, that translates into uh, into an effective area of emission. The, the, that the varies with frequency. The, oh, okay. Which varies with frequency. Yeah, yes. right, with varies the black with body frequency. gives you the intensity. Yeah, the intensity the total as a factor of frequency and energy absorbed. And received. frequency corresponds to it. Yeah. And I think what's just the key part of this model is that we, if, in order to like correctly image this um, these fluxes and these frequencies, we have to you know use GRMHD, and that's kind of one of my motivations. Um, and then, yeah, and also the centroid motion gives us another constraint that's consistent with this idea of a thermal electron model. And in order to explain that centroid, we need a hotspot, some region of where electrons are harder, hotter than um, the ambient temperature. And in order to match the centroid, that hotspot needs to be between 6 to 10 uh, RG from uh, the center of our black hole. But the problem with the hotspot models is that you know, we know from our gravity measurements that this centroid motion can appear and kind of disappear. So when it's not slowly moving around in a circle, it's sort of kind of uh, moving like near the median region and we can act, okay, so 
why like what mechanism causes the hotspot to appear and disappear uh one more question so when you're saying that the you're looking at this at basically 230 gigahertz right so is this comp is this already accounting for gravitational redshift or is it not i mean is so, it I, I'm not familiar whether, like, I don't think the model included gravitational redshifts. When we make our images, definitely we include all GR effects. I know that when you, like, when they measure centroids and, um, like, the measurements of the galactic center are just getting so precise because there's a lot of interest in the galactic center that they're able to account for redshifting now and some other, like, GR effects. But yeah, I don't believe this model. This model is just, modeling like the total uh, luminosity. So it's assuming that that's actually produced at 230 gigahertz. Yeah. Also, oh. there's no, um, like the galactic center is really close to us. So there's no like redshift due to, um, I don't know, like expansion or. or... <laughs> no, no, I I'm, I'm meant I'm the redshift of climbing out of the potential well from Sagittarius A star, but not not the expansion redshift, but yeah. If it's so, 20 or three. Yeah, then it's a relatively way. small effect. Gravitational redshift. Yeah. But like when we actually like create images, all those effects are accounted for. Okay. All right. So my advisor, Jason Dexter, found a model that actually explains the origin of these hotspots. And the key aspect of this model is that he can explain both the NR, um, the near infrared centroid motion and the near-infrared flaring stemming from a single physical event, which I'll go over um, later in the talk. But he only looked at a high spin case. And so some natural questions, uh, all this work is kind of stemming from this model would be, for example, can we predict uh, anything else at other frequencies that might be relevant for observation? Um, can we make a prediction that is distinct and separates our model from other competing models. Uh, one issue when we want to explain uh, Sagittarius A star is that we have to create like a library of images from different models and try to do Bayesian fits to fit okay, which model works best. So it's interesting if we could find some extreme like qualitative difference between one model versus the other and we can differentiate between the two um, rather than comparing statistics of fits. We'd like to just explore a larger parameter space to see if this behavior continues and um, long enough times for measuring like observables. And so the answer to all these questions, I guess kind of got ahead of me is just, yes, like we're able to do all these things. And these are gonna be the questions I'm gonna answer uh, in this talk. So before we dive into the model, I wanna just talk about, you know, what some key parameters and regions of a black hole so the first key parameter is its spin. Um, we don't have, we like this spin is unknown for a Sagittarius A star, um, but in general relativity, there's a natural speed limit to everything, the speed of light. So there's a natural limit to how fast a black hole can actually rotate. And that limit is MC and uh, gravitational units. And so we often refer to the spin, not in units, but in this dimensionless parameter A. So a, uh, a of about 0.9, you'll see A is of 0.375 is a high spinning black hole. And then you can have A's of like 0 0.3, 0 0.5, which are lower spins. Do we know anything about the distribution of spins? Like in, in the universe? Yes. No, because- Not observation. Yeah, not observation, because this is really hard to constrain. This is like, we just don't know for Sagittarius A star and it's really hard to constrain. There's a lot of effort being put into measuring spins, there's this idea that um, the edge, well, it's not, this is theory, but the edge of the accretion disk depends on spin. And there are ideas of going out and actually observing this edge. So like the resolution on the EHT isn't enough to actually determine the spin of the black hole, but there's like experiments that want to look out like the high, like the, I think iron lines inside the disk and see, you know, where is that emission coming from? And if they can constrain the black hole spin better. So we have to consider that Sag A star might be like 0.01 mm -hmm. or 0.9. Yeah, and that's what I mean by we have to model in a pretty large parameter space. And there's more things we don't know about Sagittarius A star, uh, which of course like leads to a lot of degeneracy in our models because you can have one parameter change and then have another parameter change and these observables can have like similar effects, but 
you know, you changed different things, right? There isn't a key, like just a thing that only depends on spin, you know, well, there is, but it's hard to measure. And so here's a kind of cartoon of uh, what a black hole looks like if we look at to sort of the inner region. So we have the accretion disk. In this case, I'm drawing a quite of a puffy accretion disk. It has a, a scale, you know, a scale height, which is like the height to uh, radius ratio, like around one, a half to one. Um, and then what you get is this cusp. So in black holes, there's actually a minimum radius where material can stably ro rotate or have a stable orbit around the black hole. So, so, just, so just, yeah, just to clarify. So the whole thing, everything rotates this way. Yeah, so I'm choosing so like angular momentum. Rotates, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. It so, gradient at large distances. Yeah, so in this model, um, the black hole. our black hole is rotating counterclockwise. And you might remember from our gravity measurements, the gravity measurements were clockwise. So just keep in mind that everything I discussed in our models is we think is mirrored in like the real yes. system, um, which is which is a, yeah, exactly. Naive question, but yeah. like, isn't the black hole perfectly yeah. isotropic? So how would we know that it itself is rotating? Like uh, so things around it's it not rotating. if it's rotating, and nor is the space time around it. So if it yeah, yeah the rotation breaks that symmetry in the z direction. So yeah, we're choosing like positive z first, then, um, but it will break that symmetry, and the space time also okay. no longer has radial symmetry. Um, now it has like cylindrical symmetry. Okay. Um, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So then, and so like, like, so there's this region where the disk uh, or the torus effectively stops. Uh, well, it doesn't stop, but it kind of has a minimum radius, and then anything that accretes into the black hole is just falling in. It doesn't have. Um, it can't just stably orbit the black hole. So you get this cusp. And then another important region is the jet. So this is a famous, um, you know, one explanation of this jet is the blanford zanike mechanism uh, kind of became observationally famous when objects like M87 have these like giant jets that spew out material, you know, sometimes about the size of the galaxy itself. Uh, this is, ugly. yeah, just, yeah. So just very obvious <laughs> outflows. <laughs> um, and Sagittarius star actually doesn't have a jet like that. It doesn't spew, you know, material as far as we can see, but it because it'll have some sort of jet. Uh, we just haven't really been able to observe it. So, you know, so any spinning black hole will be able to create this jet. And you can think of this jet as um, a low density magnetically dominated region. And so I'm going to introduce a, param a parameter that becomes important when we make our images. It's sigma, um, which is just the energy density of the magnetic field over the over the um, energy density of matter. And in the accretion disk, you have sigmas that are less than one. And in the outer regions and in the jet, you're going to have sigmas that are a lot greater than one. And just keep that in the back of your head for when we discuss making images. All right, so let's get into um, the model. So we're going to be using ideal 3D general relativistic magnetohydrodynamics. And why do we do this? We want to create a global simulation of the accretion flow. So we can make images of the global simulation of the accretion flow. And we need general relativity because, like I showed, all this emission is coming from very close to the horizon, where general relativistic effects are key. And the nice thing about the GRMHD <laughs> equations as well is that this isn't like, you know, directly related to Sagittarius A star, but they are scalable by mass. And you can write them in this invariant way. And that means that our results are applicable to Sagittarius A star. But they're also applicable to a stellar mass black hole that has some of the other constraints we put on our model. And just keep in mind that the total mass that the black hole accretes in our model is a lot less than the black hole mass. So we have a static metric. It doesn't change throughout the course of the simulation. And this is also motivated by uh, experiments putting lower constraints on you know, the amount of material, the density of material in this region, and it's quite low. And we use the HARM code, a 3D version of the HARM code that was de first developed in Illinois. OK, so let's Maybe just. I'm getting ahead of you here. Yeah. What is ideal? 
So ideal is you're um, like setting the explicit resistivity to zero. So it's just like the MHD condition. Yeah. Okay. So in you know the code, so the code is a single fluid code, but we evolve the electron separately. So we call it like a two temperature um, code. And to do this, we use Greg Werner's work. <laughs> um, we use his electron heating prescription. It's a 2D reconnection model and it sets, it assigns a electron heating fraction based on the magnetization in that region. So if, you know, usually the, it stays around 0.4, uh, 0.4, uh, a quarter for our models, but it can get as high as a half. And we don't have radiation in our models. And, you know, when you look at AGNs, for example, especially active, really active AGNs, they uh, could, yeah. AGN is. Oh, sorry, active galactic nuclei, right? Um, there's no reason that it, you know, that the pressure from radiation doesn't dynamically affect the gas. You know, this happens in stars all the time where the radiation pressure uh, matches the gravitational pressure. But Sag Sagittarius A star is a fairly low luminous source. Uh, there is some research that shows that actually it has enough luminosity to affect things like the spectrum. But for our models, we just don't deal with radiation at all. Um, so we're not losing energy to radiation in the GRMHD code. And so we call this a radially inefficient, and you can say so inefficient at zero, um, accretion flow. And that's what I mean by low luminosity. But then, of course, you do deal with radiation because you're interested in computing. Yeah, and so what happens is, like, there. we say, like, basically the fraction of energy that's put into radiation is negligible. And this is an assumption. It may not be true. Uh, but we assume that it is negligible. And then in post-processing, we add uh, the radiation by calculating photon trajectories. The, neg the negligible for the dynamics. Dynamics of the system, not exactly, yeah. Negligible for but our it's observations. Prime right, yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, so this is kind of a cartoon of our initial conditions. Um, so this is clearly very unphysical. Uh, we have to start somewhere. So we put our black hole, we give it some spin, um, represented by that spin axis. Uh, we create a torus, so this torus is in equilibrium, in, um, hydrogen, like hydro equilibrium in 2D, but it's not in 3D, but it provides like a good initial condition. Uh, so this is just saying that we start with this inner, uh, you know, the inner region of the torus is about 12 RG. So what's going to happen is as we let this thing go, it's going to slowly accrete um, material and, you know, the material is going to flow into the black hole. We start with a poloidal magnetic field that I've sort of drawn as a cartoon here. Which which 2D is the stable the, equilibrium, the hydro equilibrium? What do you mean? You said that this is in an equilibrium in So it's like a torus. In 3D. Well, so the initial condition is axisymmetric. Yeah, yeah, it's an yeah. asymmetric. Right. And it's an, a pressure equilibrium. Oh, so it's a, with you mean it's a 2D equilibrium because it's symmetric? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. But I mean, we're going to evolve it in 3D, and it's it's not in 3D. So we start with just a single loop of uh, poloidal current. Yeah, poloidal current. Yeah, <laughs> magnetic field. A single loop, it's still, it's not, a, it's not at some fixed meridional plane. It's everywhere, right? Yeah, it is everywhere. It's just what's important yeah. here is um, that, so I'm going to discuss the uh, like conditions, the like magnetization conditions in a few slides on the black hole. And what's key is that you don't want to create uh, loops of current that are opposing one another because then what can happen is as you know the like as the magnetic field evolves they can sometimes cancel each other out sometimes not cancel each other out and so what you lose is like if you want to maintain a highly magnetized state and you have loops of current that are opposing one another they can like cancel each other out and you can you know lose that effective view field if that makes sense so this magnetic Poloidal magnetic field is caused by currents in the accretion disk itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but like how we start it is sort of not physical, but yeah, it's it's just from the accretion disk, not from like the black hole itself. And this is the resolution that we use. Um, what I guess an important thing to keep in your head is that we use log spacing for R. That means that this inner region is really well resolved. And as we go further and further out, like it's just out here, uh, we you know, lose the resolution, but we really don't care what happens at the outer region of the disk. How far do you go? Like to RG1 or two, maybe? 
So like which direction? So going you towards the black like, hole, we actually go inside the black hole. So one kind of nice thing about GRMHD for, you know, in like, well, it's TR, but like applying GRMHD to black holes is that your inner uh, boundary region is inside the black hole and you're, you have a metric on the system. So the metric says nothing inside the black hole can affect what's going on outside. And so effectively it doesn't really matter what your boundary, like you're, you can define this boundary very loosely I mean, you don't have to be very careful about, well, you do have to be careful, but it's just, you have a lot more latitude than if this boundary was like a physical thing, for example, in like neutron stars that you had to care about. The GR MHD, I mean, it's an approximation, but it captures that feature well, I gather. Well, I mean, it like the metric kind of forces it to do that so that your inner boundary later, because like, the metric says that Anything that happens inside the black hole, you know, can affect space time outside the black hole beyond the event horizon. Um, so that's why we can be kind of loose in like what that boundary is doing. Um, and then, I mean, another aspect of why we use fluid models is that they're just easier to do and to capture the whole like global simulation of this disk. You know, I read a paper recently that they're able to do GRMHD, uh, not GRMHD, GRPIC, where they actually made images. Uh, from a global pick simulation, but you know it was it only ran for like 40 RG over C, which is a few minutes. So if you want to do like a long time simulation, then it's just easier to use MHD. And there's definitely though some caveats, and I'll discuss those like towards the end. Is that clock right? Probably. It is 11:50. <laughs> oh my god. Okay. Should I rush? All right, let me like rush towards one image. Sorry. Okay, so let me, I just want to get to this slide to just show how we're um, making our simulation. So one key thing is that, as I already discussed kind of what's happening here, that we need black hole spin, we need to um, provide some initial conditions for the B field. I didn't get to define what MAD versus SANE is, so maybe I'll get to do it in a moment. But then we feed this information into uh, a code that my advisor, Jason Dexter, developed, which is produces polarized ray traced images of the GRMHD code. And in order to do that, we need a few input parameters. We assume that uh, synchrotron is thermal. We need to choose a frequency. We also choose our own uh, mass accretion rate in order to match the observed average flux in the 230 gigahertz. So that's well constrained. And then this is where sigma becomes important. Uh, we apply a sigma cut to the disk. So we're saying that we only care about emission from the disk. We don't care about emission from magnetically dominated regions. And then we also have to choose like an observation angle for our images, which is just this diagram here. It's just the angle between the black hole spin axis and the line of sight. And then we get an image. All right, so let's look at some movies. All right, here's a movie. So, because <laughs> like you, you gotta have a movie. Um, yeah, so on the left hand side, this is a movie at 238 gigahertz, kind of made directly from the GRMHD simulations. Um, and you're looking at it, intensity maps. It's scaled to the one fifth. So these are like actual values of intensity, but it, you know, like the uh, scaling is to the one fifth. And then this is the near infrared on the right. And so what I want you to, and also the field of view is the same, like kind of Python was fighting me, with me a little bit with the ticks, but uh, it is the same field of view. And what you're going to see is like some variability in both the 230 gigahertz and near fresh size. But at some point, you're going to see um, a giant hot spot or a blob of near infrared emission, and it's going to rotate around the black hole center. And at the same time, you'll see both a drop in flux and the 230 gigahertz and also a, a bubble, a kind of a gap forming in the 230 gigahertz emission. So let's watch it. And are these movies the emission from the location or are they corrected for So they include all of gravitational effects. The so only, this is what we would see. Yeah, so, well, okay. I mean, a little, because there's some resolution involved there. Yeah. And there's a little bit of nuance in like what we'd actually see, but this is like, yeah, assuming that you could see at 230 gigahertz and you're an observer far away, um, you can see all the detail then yes, this is what you would see 
So it accounts for all gravitational effects. The only effect it doesn't account for is the light travel time. Um, but because it's just, it's harder to do. So let's just play the movie. So you see like just some emission, some variation, and then all of a sudden you get this region forming and that gap forming at 230 gigahertz. Should we play it again? Or... <laughs> but that's so cool. <laughs> so much to see. Right. So that you see the gap forming and also that centroid moving. Right. And that kind of happens over the course of two hours. And what is the so the like centroid we saw it moving around is is that uh, orbit time? Yeah, so it orbits it like, like with orbit those... time. Um, so it's not Keplerian exactly. It's because but... it's too close. Yeah. So I mean, you have to also be careful. So because we're in, you know, we're dealing with GRFX, like, so I guess I can just show the next slide. So what's happening in the disk, right? The disk, this is like a top down view. It's average over, over polar angle. But uh, you can see that there is this, you know, low density region that's rotating with the disk. Uh, and it is like sub Keplerian, it, you know, it has like, you know, the actual orbital motion is maybe like 5%, 10% of the speed of light. Um, well, it's, it's a physical thing moving, yeah. not like a wave. That's yeah, it's a physical thing. I, I said just to be careful with the centroid uh, emission, though, because all these gravitational effects can, you know, bend the light. And, you know, that's why we do this work, is that it's unclear, like, what it actually would look like in the end. So these are um, showing all, like, the fluid parameters of the disk. I don't know if I have a lot of time to go through these, but... I think the important part is, you know, the first part is density. So you can see this low density region forming. And then in the second row, we have electron temperature. And you can see that that low density region is hot um, and it produces electrons that are about 10, 100 to 1,000 times the ambient temperature. I'm gonna kind of rush to this slide here. And so this shows the exact same thing. You know, there's really, no change, it's just a larger field of view. So there's nothing interesting happening in the first two times, but at the last time, this is the peak of the 230 gigahertz size. You see that even in like the outer region, so maybe from 15 to uh, 30 RG, you also get an increase in temperature. And so the conclusion right, is that both the bubble region forming and also this temperature increase in the outer regions probably leads to this increase in the 230 gigahertz um, emission region size. So these are just more plots of the centroid motion in the infrared on the right, and the size increase in the 230 gigahertz on the left. And it's a different scaling. Um, also, the field of view on the 230 is double the field of view on the near infrared. But here you can see uh, the centroid motion. The green line is just showing how the centroid moves. And um, on the left-hand side, you just, that ellipse is uh, fit to the minor and major like uh, uh, standard deviations, like assuming that it's Gaussian. Obviously, it's not Gaussian, but we just assume that it's Gaussian, and then we can fit that ellipse um, to that object and then show that it increases in size. And this, yeah, I don't want to talk about the magnetic flux, but this behavior seems to, you know, it's not just a rare event; it happens quite frequently. In fact, like ninety percent of our near-infrared flare peaks, which is twice the standard deviation um, value. So like you can define a flare, it has to be double uh, the standard deviation of the flare distribution. And 90% of these peaks are followed by a 230 gigahertz size. And the whole reason that we're you know, motivating this idea is that when the EHT observed the Sagittarius A star a few years ago, they avoided flaring regions because they wanted to create a static image and that, you know, if you image, if you want to create something static during a time of extreme variability, you're going to have a lot of sources for error. But it, the HD is capable of making movies, like dynamic observations of Sagittarius A-star. And with the upgrades, the next generation HD, they'll be more capable to actually reconstruct images of their dynamic observations. And so what we're hoping is that it's actually a good idea to look during a near infrared flare and try to capture this dynamic this variability and the 2 gigahertz in order to support um, our model 
versus models that don't have such high magnetization. Because that's the key parameter that I skipped over that this model has that other models don't, is that our disks are magnetized, other models are not. And so this is just kind of, I guess I just want to kind of just end on this key point. So a sane disk is a disk that uh, roughly is just not as magnetized as the mad disk, which is the model that you know I've been describing. And you can see that we actually are able to reproduce the static image of the EHT observation. It corresponds to roughly that size, but there's just no, you know, very minimal, there's some variability, but just very minimal variability. And you don't see these dramatic size increases that you do in the mad case. I guess I can take questions. Um, unless people are interested in caveats. <laughs> well, why don't we thank RP? Yeah. And uh, then we can take questions and you can ask about caveats if you want.